Hello and welcome. And um, before I introduce this week's guest, here's a recommendation for you. If you're struggling with making important decisions, check out a book called The Necktie and the Jaguar by retired clinical psychologist, Jungian analyst and shamanic practitioner, Carl Greer. In the book, he reveals how he tapped into the wisdom and power of unseen worlds for guidance and inspiration. And it's a fascinating memoir, which offers some valuable keys and questions that inspire the kind of thinking that guides you effortlessly on your own path to transformation. You can check it out for yourself at carlgreer.com. And now joining me today to share the stories behind the 10 books that influenced him the most on his life journey is spiritual counselor, workshop leader, public speaker, meditation teacher, and interfaith minister, Philip Goldberg, who also is the author or co-author of numerous books himself, including American Vader, From Emerson and the Beatles to Yoga and Meditation, How Indian Spirituality Changed the West, and The Life of Yogananda, the story of the yogi who became the first modern guru. Philip Goldberg, welcome. It's good to have you with us. Great to be with you, Sandy. So tell me, first question, how challenging was it for you to compile a list of just 10 books? It was agony. <laughs> it, no, some of the books were obvious and easy. The, the hard part was keeping it to 10 and making the, those final decisions. It, it really wasn't it was, it, I really did labor over it. And there were some things that I, yeah, I'm just going to mention a few just to, so they're at least. So we know what we're missing. <laughs> <laughs> a, there was a book called The Idea of the Holy by a German uh, author and a scholar named Rudolf Otto that blew my mind early on. Uh, it, it, he talked, it, he has a whole language of spiritual experience in there that uh, was a big influence on me. Most, many of the books by Alan Watts, I wanted to include one of Alan Watts's book, but I couldn't decide on which one, so I left him out entirely. But, um, you know, three, four, five of his books had a, a big influence on me. Well, I won't mention any of the others, but there, there were, several oh, the cosmic consciousness by bucky um yeah i, yeah. I would say i have to leave them out but did I had, you feel guilty no because they're all dead and they won't know <laughs> <laughs> but i felt badly for the audience who, you know won't get those recommendations so now that i've heard at least a few well, it's it's interesting, you know, I guess we should maybe increase it a little bit because we get the same books coming up again and again and again. Okay. And, um, you know, it really is interesting to see what rises to the top. And your first book, uh, the first book on your list, and your list is not um, chronological, it is alphabetical. Yeah. Um, the first book on your list, uh, well, I would say it tends to show up about 50% of the time. I'm sorry, say again? It shows up about 50% of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I found that in my own research, you know, for my own books and interviewing people. It, yeah. Autobiography of a Yogi was the most often mentioned book uh, when I uh, asked people what got them started on their spiritual path or what turned them toward the teachings of the East. If they mention a book, it was more often than not autobiography of a yogi. So when did that book come into your life and what was your response to it? I can show you the copy I read in 1970. Um, I was already on my spiritual path. I had started transcendental meditation two years prior to that. I was gearing up to become a teacher of that. I was sort of studying with uh, Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, and I was reading all kinds of stuff, and somehow Autobiography of Yogi came into the picture in the 70s, in 1970. I borrowed the book from somebody long forgotten, and I never returned it, and I still have that same copy, and I like to say I'm, I work off the karma of 
ripping off somebody's book by talking about and writing about Yogananda a lot. So it had a big impact on me, like it has on millions of people. Some of those people, you know, go on to become students of Yogananda's, hardcore disciples of Yogananda's. I never did. Uh, I had my own path, but he was, you know, one of my key sources. I returned to the book. And of course, I had to write about Yogananda in, in American Veda and in the biography I did of him. So now I'm rereading an autobiography for probably the fifth time because I'm teaching a course on it starting in January. And I'm finding new things that I you know, hadn't taken notice of before. It's one of those books that you, you can return to many, many times. Mm. And your, um, your uh, version of the story, you're, leave, you're filling in a lot of the gaps yeah. uh, where he didn't tell us certain things. So we will talk about that later because yeah. uh, I'm reading your version now. And um, it is interesting because I haven't read autobiography of a yogi for 20 years and a lot is coming back to me but there's also so much that I didn't didn't well know. that's why I wrote the biography I, mm. I realized he had a fascinating life story and he leaves out a lot of it and so mm. I, I filled in the gaps you know back in the 1980s and 90s I think I used to see autobiography of a yogi again and again in thrift stores in England Right. And it seemed like every single thrift store had a copy and either, you know, they kept getting new copies given to them or they had the same copy that nobody bought secondhand. But um, and I always used to wonder, why was I seeing that book all the time? You know, was it a really good book that everybody had it or was it a really bad book? Nobody wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't realize until I read it for myself, of course, um, you know, what a, an incredible book it is. So if you were given your love of yoga and given the work that you're doing you know uh yourself writing your biography would you say this is your favorite of the 10 um i i i don't like to think in terms of favorites or rank them in order because especially in this category they all filled a need at a, at a certain time in in my spiritual path so i i wouldn't i would hesitate to to put that kind of label on it i'm i'm a lover of fiction so i have three novels on the list you and i you know those two could be called any of yeah. them it could be my favorite at any moment in time uh, i i was thinking in terms of impact and what mm -hmm. influence they had on me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And some of them are one-time reads that had a big impact on me, and I, I'm not likely to ever return to them. Some are books to return to and, mm -hmm. and take a you know fresh look at or look something up in. Yeah, yeah. Well, book number two is also another one that crops up again and again and again, and that, of course, is Bhagavad Gita. Um, and everybody seems to have this on their favorites as well. Yeah. So when did you come across this? Um, actually, you skipped one. Not on my list, I haven't. Oh, um, no, I haven't skipped one. Your list was moved around a little bit when we published ah. it on the website, and oh. I'm looking at a version of that. It's all ten are there, I can promise you. Oh, okay, because I'm looking at my alphabetized list. Yeah, yes. okay, so we'll go by your, your order. Um, the, the Bhagavad Gita is the one I return to most, and if I had to say which is the most important to me, uh, it, it's the Gita. If any book has been... Uh, a, a consistent guide and one I've returned to, you know, and I've taught workshops on the Gita. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking right now at a bookshelf that has about 15 different translations and commentaries. Uh, and that doesn't, and I have a couple more on my Kindle. <laughs> and so it's, it's one of those books uh, that is, is so profound in its brevity 
the first time I read it, um, I I heard about it when I was reading a Thoreau's Walden. And he mentions reading this thing called the Bhagavad Gita and how you know important it was to him. And so I went out and got a copy. And at the time, it wasn't easy. This is the late 60s. And uh, of course, now you can get any of you know dozens of translations at the click of a mouse. And it's very interesting to me to, to compare the translations of uh, verses that are I, I hold to be important because the nuance of language in the translation gives it you know added meaning. Uh, and I come I come back to it all the time. I quote it in my lectures and my workshops. It's you know, the last book I wrote is called Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times. And I, I was guided by the one, uh, uh, pa uh, one passage in the, in the Gita that has always stood out to me. The first time I heard the Sanskrit, I remembered it forever. It's Yogasta Kuru Karmani. And I don't know Sanskrit. I can't read it. I, I don't know much about it. But that I remembered, and it, it means established in yoga, perform action. And there's so much in that one sentence, established in yoga, in the state of consciousness of unity that yoga signifies, then go out and do what you have to do in the world. So it, it, it was permission to be a, a person in the world and also spiritual and a formula for how to live. And I've tried to uh, live up to that and remember it always. And there's always new things to discover in the Gita. It's, it's one of those, it, there's no, it, it's probably other than the Bible, the most translated of the sacred texts worldwide. Mm. Do you find when you read other translations, um, that uh, you're learning new things because someone has a slightly different perspective? Yes, especially if there's a commentary by somebody knowledgeable. Translations by themselves, you often have to wonder, what do they mean by that? Or why did they choose that word? Or mm. I, I, I like the other one better or, you know. Uh, but when you get a commentary, then you see one of the reasons I, I love the book is if you talk to certain people, they'll tell you the Gita means this, the Gita's central idea is this, and then somebody else will have a totally different idea of what the central idea is and the most important thing is. And that to me is a sign of greatness because people find meaning in it, whoever they are, they find value and a profundity. And so I learn about other people's spiritual paths and their uh, orientations by reading commentaries on something like the Gita, because then you realize, oh, I saw it this way, and it means this to me, but somebody else has a different path. And yeah. you know, there, the similarities and differences uh, among people on different paths is, has always been fascinating to me, and it keeps me on my toes. Mm -hmm. Well, book number three, again, is uh, another book that appears on many people's lists and um, probably for a similar reason that you gave when you commented that reading it was like sitting by a fire with an eccentric uncle who was way hipper than your parents and far wiser than you. It is, of course, Be Here Now by Ram Dass. Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting. You said uh, autobiography of a yogi comes up most often. Uh, and in my interviews too. The second most mentioned book is Be Here Now. But the punchline in my case is when I interviewed Ram Dass, he mentioned autobiography of the yogi. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Ram Dass was a towering figure in the meeting of East and West. He was sort of a prototype of a Westerner who becomes uh, deeply immersed in the traditions of the East and becomes a proponent of them and a, a transmitter 
a disseminator um, on a large scale and somebody who was always very open and honest about his own life and, and all that and always had a great sense of humor and could relate to Westerners in ways that, you know, swamis and Buddha, Buddhist monks and so forth from other cultures don't necessarily uh, aren't able to do. And when I interviewed him, he said he was like an uncle to the people of my generation who were young seekers back in the 70s. And I thought about that and I thought, yeah, and reading Be Here Now is like hanging out with your very hip uncle, you know, your, your, ex your hippie uncle who is, you know, <laughs> older than you, but younger than your parents and hipper than everybody. And that, that's, that's what it was like. And so, you, you know, you absorb the same essential teachings that you might in something like the Bhagavad Gita, but it's coming to you in different language and different style, you know, from, from your eccentric elder. And it's, it still holds up that way in its own crazy mm. fashion. So this was published in 1971. When do you think you read it? Oh, not long after publication. I was also mm. already, you know, I, I knew who Ram Dass was. I was, you know, already well along my spiritual path. It had become a priority in my life, but I heard this was out. People were talking about it. People were reading it. It looked so wild and, you know, wacky and I, I couldn't resist. So, uh, you know, I probably read it in 72 or something. Um, mm. And then got a new copy of it when I realized I somewhere along the way lost mine and I needed it for my research on American Veda. Is this a book that you go back to? Occasionally, yes. Yeah, I want to see well, how would, what did Ram Dass say about that? How was that in the book? And there's all these quotes in the book from different sources. So I've, I've, I've <laughs> stolen from that as well. And I show it to people sometimes. It's like, oh, you really? You never heard of Be Here Now, youngster? Let me show it to you. <laughs> <laughs> youngster. <laughs> you're, yeah. Now you're the uncle. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, book four is our first work of fiction, first published in The New Yorker as two sequential stories, Fanny and Zooey by mm. J.D. Salinger, yeah. 1957. Franny and Zooey was the first exposure uh, of mine and most people to the spiritual side of J.D. Salinger. Most people know J.D. Salinger, at least in the U.S., for Catcher in the Rye, which to this day, 70 years or more after publication, is required reading. My niece read it in high school not long, you know, a year or two ago. Um, back in the day, it, it, you know, and still it's, it's a, you know, a book for ex especially adolescents who are uh, unconventional or a little uh, um, not in the mainstream and helps them feel good about themselves. And, you know, and you can see in that, in The Catcher in the Rye, if you know Salinger's later works, you could see the seeds of the spiritual seeker that he was in, in the character. But Salinger himself was an ardent devotee, strongly influenced by uh, Vedanta philosophy and Zen and other of the mystical teachings, also of Yogananda, this great uh, story about him and Yogananda. But uh, he was a devotee of one of the Swamis in New York, Swami Nikolananda. And in Franny and Zui and subsequent works, he portrays a family of young people uh, and their parents in New York and their ardent seekers, seekers of truth, and they're delving into the spiritual teachings of the mystics and, and the yogis and, the, and all the uh, Eastern uh, the philosophies, and they're trying to live a life true to spiritual principles. And so when, when I first read it, I said, oh, he's, here's, he's putting into the lives of fictional characters what I'm going through and what some of my friends are going through. It made you feel less alone 
you learned from it. And um, I, I return to not just Franny and Zui, but um, some of his short stories and subsequent books where he, you know, one of his characters, Franny and Zui's older brother, Seymour Glass is sort of portrayed as a ordinary New Yorker, but a kind of a Zen master. Uh, and it had a big impact on me and a lot of other people. Mm. Well, the main character in your next book, which is also a novel on my list, became something of a role model, you said to you in early yeah. on in your path. And the book yeah. is The Razor's Edge by Somerset Maugham, published in 1944. And the main character was Larry Darrell. Why was he a role model for you? Because <clears throat> the story is about Larry Darrell, who's a, you know, Somerset Mom was a celebrated British novelist, and he must have had a spiritual inkling because um, he he went to India at one point, either for research or for his own curiosity, and visited the, you know the great uh, revered Saint Ramana Maharshi in his ashram and modeled the guru figure in Razor's Edge after him. Uh, but the story itself is about a, a young man who comes back from World War I, a, a, a young man of privilege. I mean, really high level privilege uh, in New York with, you know, a, with a fiance waiting for him, about to enter, you know, the upper classes of society and money and wealth and uh, propriety and all the rest. Uh, and says, uh, sorry, no longer interested in it. You know, the war had a big impact on me. I just, I'm going to search for truth and meaning and I don't care about money and I'm going to, I'll drive a taxi if I want. And I was driving a taxi as a student in New York at the time. And I said, and I was starting to read all these other books and be a spiritual seeker. So, you know, the courage he had to do that. And he wanders and he has odd jobs and he ends up in an, ash in an ashram in India. And I thought, oh boy, that's what I want. I want, I want that. And I want to have the integrity of uh, Larry Darrell and not uh, be afraid of uh, perhaps sacrificing uh, affluence and success and money and all that for uh, if that's what it requires to to find truth and meaning and purpose and spiritual wisdom in life, so he, it, yeah, he had a he was a bit of a role model. So, did you find your ashram and your guru? In a sense, the guru the guru started to come to us back then. I you know I was ready to I was on my way to not on my way, but I had uh, made reservations to fly to to London actually, and then go to India. But then um, my teacher at that time, I was going to train to be a teacher of transcendental meditation. And I was to go to the same ashram the Beatles had been in 68 that, that made all that famous. Uh, but the uh, demand for, <laughs> for people who wanted to be teachers was such that the guru came to the West and so my training was in America. So it took me a while to get to India, but we, I went to a lot of temporary ashrams. They would you know, rent spaces and turn them into ashrams in, in America and Europe uh, and, until I got to India. <laughs> but then, you know, I, now the term would be plural. Now I, I, I think of myself as having many gurus and many ashrams and to the extent I can, I tried to make home an ashram, <laughs> an ashram yeah. with Zoom and uh, deadlines. <laughs> well, the next book, now that you've mentioned the Beatles, is The Science of Being and Art of Living, Transcendental Meditation by Maharishi, Mahesh Yogi. Yeah, as I, I've already mentioned, he was um, my first principal teacher and probably the most influential of all the teachers I've had, um, you know, and my training with him was, uh, you know, 
profound and deeply meaningful few years of my life in the 70s and essentially set the foundation for uh, everything I've done since. Um, and I first heard of Maharshi like everybody else when you know the Beatles uh, became uh, students of his and then went to India in that, which was a you know a watershed moment in the history of uh, spirituality in the West. And I had to research it, you know, in my uh, later years when I was writing American Veda, I, I went deeply into the circumstances around that and, and remembered that the first thing I did when I heard about it was, I said, okay, I better check out this Maharishi guy. And um, so there was a book Science of Being and Art of Living. And I read that and it had a big impact on me because he essentially took the, the core teachings of you know Indian philosophy, what we think of as yoga and Vedanta and uh, all of it and, and wrote about it in, in very uh, lucid English using the language of the West and framing it in, in ways that, you know, sort of would amplify what you may have gotten from something like the Bhagavad Gita uh, and, and other books, but in a very logical and uh, uh, rational way that, and that was very important to me at the time. I didn't want any mystical jum mumbo jumbo. I didn't want any superstition. I didn't want anybody telling me what I had to believe in. And so this, this was presented as, in, as many yoga teachings are uh, as a as a rational kind of thing where you don't have to believe in anything. You, you hear some principles, you can apply them to your life. Here's practices, you know, and that it, it got me realizing that um, all many of the things I was reading at the time were pointing to meditation. That that practice is the the key here, not just thinking about stuff. And, and it got me looking for, you know, a, a proper form of meditation, which I later learned was pretty much what happened to George Harrison. You know, he read the autobiography of a yogi and other books and said, oh, it's about meditation. And that's what led them to the meeting with Maharishi that made, you know, world, that became world famous. Mm. Yeah. Number seven is The Perennial Philosophy by Aldous Huxley, published in 1944. Yeah, uh, boy, a lot of these books were published in the 40s. They became, yes. and I realized, oh, 50s, 60s, but they, they were so meaningful to my generation of seekers. The Perennial Philosophy, in fact, I just interviewed somebody for my podcast who's a scholar at, of the in writing a book on the perennial philosophy. It's, it's a controversial uh, perspective, but what it is, is essentially uh, the insight of certain scholars and, and uh, students of uh, spirituality and religion that if you look beyond the dogmas and doctrines and uh, rituals and you know the the outer layers of what we call religion you go you if you look at the what's called the esoteric part of religion the mystical teachings so you, you instead of looking at you know mainstream christianity you look at the experience of the christian mystics you look at the, the, the Jewish mystics and the Kabbalists, you look at the Sufis, you look at the yogis, you look at the Buddhist practitioners. What do they experience? How do they describe their experiences? And when you do that, you see they're all pointing to the same thing mm -hmm. and describing the same experiences in different languages with, in different with different terms having to do with their own backgrounds, their own cultures, their own time in, in history. But the essence of it is the same transcendent experience, the same inner experience, the same universal uh, love and um, light 
and, and all the things that are described using different languages. That's what the perennial philosophy identifies. And Huxley's classic book was a way of uh, anthologizing uh, from all the different traditions and categorizing the experiences they described. And it blew my mind at the time. And it, it, it created a, a foundation very consistent with the teachings of the East that there are many paths up the mountaintop, but the mountaintop, we all end up at the same mountaintop. We're all aiming for the same mountaintop. We all have our own paths, our own experiences, our own preferences, our own orientations. But the deep stuff, the transformational experiences are common. That gave me and many other people permission to be eclectic to say, oh, then there must be stuff to learn from all the different traditions. And, you know, I've been a very eclectic seeker ever since. And when I, <clears throat> when I teach, when I give write workshops, when I write, I draw as much as I can from the, the uh, der diversity of traditions to, to bring out these universal truths. Mm. Yeah. Book number eight. Um, by an author um, who doesn't appear as often as I would have expected. Um, Ken Wilber, The no. Spectrum of Consciousness. And this was a book that you said um, he did what you thought was absolutely impossible. Yeah. And, and I have to say, Ken, Ken made the cut. It was him and it was him and Alan Watts and Rudolf Otto. And I just I went with Wilbur because um, at the time I read him in the mid to late seventies, I, you know, I'd never heard of him, but, um, and he was young, he was a young man and, and not a trained psychologist, but he's one of these independent scholars who knows everything about everything and has an encyclopedic brain. <laughs> and I know that because I've interviewed him and you can ask him one question and, you know, he's just off and running. And he, he, he made an attempt to integrate the, 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 the profound insights of the uh, wisdom traditions and um, the discoveries of uh, modern psychology. And um, I had been a psych major and I'm very disillusioned and dropped out of graduate school because they weren't giving me the answers to the questions I was concerned you know about so deeply um, and so I turned to the spiritual te teachings Ken actually saw value in some of what psychology had to offer and realized that the the way psychology the, the limits of, of, of understanding in Western psychology and philosophy sort of had a, a low ceiling and if you turn if you look at the spiritual traditions, they raise the possibilities of human development beyond just, you know, grow up and be a stable, you know, human being to, you know, exalted levels of self-realization and actualization. That process had already started in psychology and he put everything together in a way that actually influenced uh, qualified psychologists in the development of humanistic and transpersonal psychology. So it had a big impact on, on, on a lot of people. And, you know, subsequently, I learned a great deal from those uh, psychologists who started to take spirituality seriously. And Ken's book was a, a starting point in that, putting on a spectrum, the developmental stages of consciousness hadn't been done before. Mm. I interviewed Ken Wilber once and I think I think it was the only interview I've ever done where I said hello and I said goodbye and that's <laughs> as much as I said because I was just entranced <laughs> and there was nothing yeah. else for me to say. I could add nothing. Well, I think, you know, I have a podcast called Spirit Matters. We've interviewed 250 to 300 people. I think to this day, Ken has the longest interview on the podcast. 
but yeah. he's brilliant, and that's what happens. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's one of those people that make you feel rather dumb. <laughs> <laughs> so book number nine, again, this one comes up again and again and again, and it is Siddhartha by Herman Hesse, published in 1922. Wow, I, I, I've forgotten how old it was when I read it. Mm -hmm. but, you know, 99 years. Jeez, wow. Yeah. That's a, you know, who's the a Nobel Prize winning novelist and uh, you know some of his the books that came to us translated into English had it they were very popular uh, you know in the counterculture of the 60s and and you know one of the books that was uh, passed around uh, from you know along with Autobiography of a Yogi and so many of the others um, were his books, not just Siddhartha, but that was the, the principal one, but um, some of his other books as well, uh, like A Magister Ludi, the, the, the uh, Bead Game, which is a mind boggling book. I actually sh should reread it now after all these years. But Siddhartha was, uh, you know, about, a, you know, it was set in India at, at the time of the historical Buddha. And it's about a um, a seeker, and it takes you through his life of you know becoming a renunciate and then coming back into the world of the senses and activity, and then you know making final choices and you know the lessons in simplicity and of uh, what it's it's sort of the 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 lessons you learn from sacred texts like the Upanishads and, and the Gita and Buddhist texts and all that are deep and profound. But when you see it portrayed in the life of a human being you can identify with in the hands of a gifted storyteller like mm -hmm. Hesta and like Somerset Maugham and like J.D. Salinger, that's why I, I wanted to include works of fiction because they come alive uh, and, and become, they teach you in a different way. And they had that impact on me. Um, it, it, you know, it, they complement the nonfiction in a way that hits you in the gut and in the heart because, you know, you're, you're seeing a story of, of a life unfold in, in the hands of a, of a master. And, and, and that's why I wanted to include those three at least. Hmm. Well, the final book on your list is, um, you say, is one of the first spiritual books that you read, and it was published in 1957, and it became an instant sensation with an entire generation of readers. The book is Zen Flesh, Zen Bones, Paul yeah. Reps. Hmm. Yeah, that, you know, my first uh, spiritual uh, source sources was Zen because I don't know why, but maybe because, you know, I was a young pseudo hipster in New York City and um, the beat poets, you know, had a legendary quality, uh, you know, and, and where I was living at the time I became a, sick, a, a seeker, you know, we knew Allen Ginsberg lived a few blocks away. And so, you know, Zen was in the air to a certain extent. And, you know, it was very hip. And uh, some of the poets we might have read were. And so um, one of the books, you know, one of Alan Watts's famous books was, was about Zen and there were others, but Zen Flesh, Zen Bones captured the sort of spirit of Zen because it, it, it's, um, it's made up of Zen stories, these, these little pithy tales that have a kind of mind-blowing aspect to them of, you know, not just 
they, the, the, the Zen stories and the uh, Zen aphorisms, they tend to, to me, they, they hit you in a different way than like a treatise would or a, you know, a regular explanation of a, of a, a concept or a principle because <laughs> they somehow have a punchline that's surprising and you know, enigmatic. And, you know, there's the book also has all these koans, these unanswerable puzzles that the Zen masters use with the, the, the students to ponder and, and ultimately surrender to, so, you know, the, 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 what is the sound of one hand clapping kind of, mm -hmm. you know, if you think about it will drive you crazy and ultimately you realize the rational mind can only take you so far which yeah. is one of the great you know teachings of, of zen but they it's played out so you 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 get that experience by struggling with these aphorisms and uh and and seeing you know seeing it played out in stories it yeah it was had a big impact I sh I, now I'm 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 inclined to go back and read some of these because you made me think about them, and some of them I haven't looked at in decades, and it would be really interesting to uh, mm. to go back to see if I still think Salinger's a great writer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I find that I almost learn as much from novels as I do from nonfiction. And I think it's because I approach a novel in a different way, probably because I'm a lot more relaxed and open, you know, thinking it's going to be just a story. And then I suddenly find it's teaching me something quite profound. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what great fiction will do. And we're here, you know, talking about spiritual version of that. But, you know, I remember reading works of fiction as a young man and, th and, and learning great lessons about life and love and other things. But, you know, this is the spiritual version of that. And, yeah. and seeing, seeing seekers like myself depicted on the page. And there's a movie version of Razor's Edge that is not bad. It was made in 1946. And I should tell listeners, um, there was there were two movies versions. One was the, the one in 1946 in beautiful black and white. Uh, it's much better than the one in the 80s with Bill Murray as uh, the lead character. It's it's not very good, but the the old one is. There was a movie about Siddhartha that it was you know a little too hippie psychedelic. <laughs> so it didn't didn't go very far, but sometimes movies can you know. I'd love to see a good movie version of of uh, Razor's Edge again. Or and Salinger never let his books be made into movies, but that would be maybe fun. I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm. So um, what are you reading now? other than my own writing so I can make it better. Um, I'm actually, it, funny enough, I think I mentioned this, I'm rereading Autobiography of a Yogi because it's the 75th anniversary of publication. So I was asked to teach an online course going through it. So I'm, I'm starting to reread that again. And I'm reading, a, there's a bunch of nonfiction that's related to some of the, um, writing I'm doing now. And I'm, re I'm reading a novel that has nothing to do with spirituality. It has to do with baseball and stuff. So <laughs> didn't you, you just need a good story. Didn't you write a novel about baseball? I did. I did. You did. Thank you for mentioning that. I did. Yeah. And um, it was well, not about baseball. It's about a family, but there's a lot of baseball in it. And it's uh, based on my own childhood and that was published in the 90s but what i've been working on uh sub uh, through the pandemic is the sequel to that 
which I'd been threatening to write for about 25 years and kept making excuses and the pandemic ended my last excuse. I wasn't traveling, I wasn't you know, doing anything. So I, I've been working on that and it's very satisfying. And that's a, an explicitly spiritual book. In fact, it's, it's based, it's fiction, but it's, the character is very much like I was at the time I read the books we've been talking about. Mm. And it's set in the late 60s. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, so it's an attempt to portray, it's attempted, it, it's an attempt to do what I've just been talking about, which is portray in fiction a, a spiritual seeker trying to live in the world. And I, you know, if I could do it a fraction with the fraction of the skill of the people on my list, I'd be very pleased. So do you find writing a novel quite different than writing nonfiction? Oh, very. Very, and do you and find I, it easier? I, I my dream, Sandy. Sometime in the next few years, one of your guests will name my novel as one of their 10 books. <laughs> I'll let you know if they do. Okay. But it is very different. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's cer certain skills are the same. Because yeah. in my nonfiction, I, I, well, in, in nonfiction, like the biography of the Yogananda, and in, to some extent, other books where, I, where you bring into play anecdotes or, you know, profiles of people, you're telling stories. So some of the skills yeah. are the same, but it, it's not the same because you, you're, you're, um, your first priority in nonfiction is the facts and, you know, truth and, you know, the yeah. monster. You don't order. have to build your character because your character. Right. You, that's right. You're not that, the characters. You know, if you're writing a novel, you, you know, you're creating yeah. human beings on a page. And uh, that's a, then the creative process is different. Uh, there's something liberating about work, working in fiction, something extra challenging and difficult, but also liberating at the same time. Because, and if you, you talk to people who write fiction, whether they're amateurs or, you know, celebrated authors, they'll often tell you they start to work and they have a character and they have a scene and then things start to happen in their imagination on their own. The characters take over, they'll yes. say. Yeah. And their job is to stand back and not get in the way and to write down what's happening. And that is very real. Yeah. Real and it's incredibly exhilarating when it happens and when you when you're, you know, think you're writing a scene and then suddenly a character says something or another character walks on your stage and you say, I didn't plan that, but this is what's happening. And um, it's, it's beautiful. Then you have to go back, of course. And the, the process of rewriting and editing and all that is similar to nonfiction, but has a different quality. It's, and it's a different level of satisfaction. So tell me, why did you decide to write a biography of Yogananda? Because when I wrote American Veda, which chronicles, you know, 200 years of history of um, spiritual teachings coming to the West, principally the U.S., but similar story in the U.K. and, and other parts of Europe, um, I profiled the main gurus who came here. And... Um, Yogananda was an, a very important figure in this story. And so I gave him a full chapter and I got fascinated with his life because, you know, not many uh, renunciates, you know, monks, especially from the East, talk very much about their, you know, pre-monk life and their families and their educations and, you know, all that. And Yogananda did, of course, famously in Autobiography of Yogi and, and, and some of the, you know, his public talks and all that. So I, what I could glean of his life was fascinating. And the period of time he was in the US, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 
was very eventful historically. And so um, I found myself enjoying writing the chapter on him, but frustrated because I didn't have enough space to tell the full story. So I thought after the book was published and stuff and, you know, was well received, I thought, well, what could I, what should I do next? Maybe a biography of one of these great masters. And he was the obvious one, but my first thought was, but he wrote the autobiography. So what's, and that's what my agent said. That's what editors said. So I went back to autobiography of Yogi and, and real, that's when it hit me how much he leaves out. And I did a page count and, you know, he came to the West at age 27 and spent all but one year of the remaining 32 years of his life being this world teacher in the U.S. headquartered, you know, half hour from where I live in Los Angeles. And only 10 percent of this autobiography is about his time after coming to America. And I said, I, I, I want to tell the full story. And I know there were challenges and difficulties that he doesn't write about. But he, he sometimes spoke about it, but it comes out in other people's you know, writings about him, people who knew him, who wrote journals and, and newspaper. It's in the newspapers, front page lawsuits and all this. And I said, oh, you know, somebody's I got to tell this full story because it's a great unique life and mm -hmm. filled with you know spiritual uh lessons for all of us and yeah. and so that that was the motivation so tell us what did you learn that really surprised you is there anything that you know just startled you he had more responsibility and worked harder than this cheerful monk image we have would suggest. And he had more challenges. He, he was very dedicated to his mission, but he was first and foremost a, a, a Swami, a monk. He renounced the world, you know, of family and all that because he wanted to, you know, find enlightenment and oneness with God. And part of him wanted to just go back to India and live in a little ashram or, you know, a cave somewhere like other monks. He envied them, but he had a mission. And here he was, a stranger in a strange land, a racist time. I mean, he was a dark skinned Hindu from a foreign culture. He, he faced a lot of adversity and opposition um, and uh, racism. And he, you know, he was here during the Great Depression. He was he had to worry about money and the foolishness of some of the people who worked for him <laughs> and personalities, just like any entrepreneur or any you know CEO, only he was a spiritual teacher first and foremost. How he did that, how he combined those two things, making spirituality the prep priority for him and his disciples, and yet work very hard, overcome obstacles, pay the bills, get on the train, go give the talk, write the books. That was fascinating to me because most of us, you know, very few of your listeners um, are monks. We're in the world and we have families and relationships and jobs and we have to deal with money and blah, blah, blah. Well, so did he in his own way. And so in a, in a certain way, this business of being a spiritual being in the world, he exemplified, even though he was a monk, and most of us are not. He didn't have a family. He didn't have to you know, deal with soccer practice and taking the kids to the dentist. But he had responsibility for his followers yeah. and his mission. And so it was a you know fascinating story. So, and most gurus you don't you don't know those details of that. No, no. So how did your view of him? How did they change? The more that you dug yeah. deep, the more that you learned. Yeah. How did your feelings about well, him I started change? out with a lot of you know respect for him and 
gratitude for you know his contribution but then getting to essentially live with in a certain way the human being i i just i came away with more affection for him because now he was real he wasn't just this you know guru figure who people revere and in some cases you know put on a a pedestal that is a little too high for my taste but seeing the human side seeing him in writing letters in which he's worried about money uh, seeing him being so upset uh, that you know a, a close follower would betray him and file a lawsuit uh, seeing him uh, want to return to india one more time but not being able to following him through the one year he did go back to india and seeing him see his father and his own guru for the last time the, the, and and he was very you know sort of candid about you know a heartbreak or you know especially in letters i came across that you know not in this, that's not in his own autobiography and and that humanized him and made him real to me and so i have a more affection for him and by extension it if I now relate to a, a living guru or go see a Swami when I go to India and all that, I see them differently. Yeah. I, I, you know, they're, they're all human beings as well as whatever else we make them out to be. And they have personalities. And I loved learning that Yogananda liked to play practical jokes and go sightseeing and buy souvenirs and go to the movies to see a, a Western film just because you know there are pleasures in life and just because you're a holy man doesn't mean you know enjoy life you know and i found that i've met many gurus and swamis in my travels and they love to laugh hmm. they might even want to you know talk about cricket or soccer or something <laughs> yeah. yeah well i'm halfway through the um, your biography and i must say it certainly does um, it gives you a whole new perspective on the man. It's, you know, he becomes fully fleshed 3D character now um, mm -hmm. instead of this slightly distant person who could do amazing things. Um, and it, it's a lovely book. It is a lovely Thank book you. to read. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe it'll show up on uh, somebody else's attempt. That yeah. But, you know, I, I, I appreciate that very much. And I hope, you know, one of the things I like in my own teaching and in writing is, you know, guru figures are often put on pedestals and then people take great delight in tearing them down. Um, and we have to be very careful not to uh, turn spiritual teachers into godlike figures and think they're infallible. You know, Yogananda made mistakes. He got upset about things we, we shouldn't. Um, we have uh, idealized notions of what spiritual teachers should be and therefore what we should be. And, uh, you know, we're... We don't we're, allow them to be human, do we? That is the being, you know, remembering that we're human and we're different and we're flawed and we're not perfect. Yeah. You know, we're, we're perfect in our imperfections and we strive to be better and we strive to be more and that's part of being human and you can't if and you see it in yogananda i saw this is interesting because people think oh he was an avatar and he was born enlightened and all that no he was born very advanced you see it in his childhood he 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 knew it he was cut out to be a spiritual leader and teacher you know when he was a kid it was obvious but in his adult life, in his letters and stuff, you see him talking about spiritual breakthroughs that he had and, and spirit, new spiritual experiences that he has. And you realize he was evolving too. He's human and he was on a spiritual path, even though he was leading others on theirs. Yes. And yeah. that's a lesson to, for all of us to absorb. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is a lovely book, and I would encourage people, if they love uh, 
autobiography of a yogi. I think, you know, you can't read that now and not read this. <laughs> um, it's yeah. like the companion book because it just you know, takes you deeper and further. Um, before we close, Philip, tell us about, um, you lead American Vader tours, don't you, to India? Uh, yes, um, well, pre-pandemic. <laughs> we, uh, we, I've done four of them. And the, the theme is we take people to places in India, in addition to, you know, main sites and holy places and temples. Uh, we, we emphasize places associated with the gurus who became famous in the West. Um, and we'll visit contemporary gurus and swamis and different lineages. Um, and we've done four of them so far, and they're very satisfying for me and the people we bring with us. We were in India last time when COVID broke out, and we were able to complete the tour. And we just scheduled one for October 2022, and our fingers are crossed that uh, we'll be able to do it. Well, let's hope so. Um, and also, just tell us quickly about your podcast. What is your yeah, goal for your podcast? It's called Spirit Matters. You find it at spiritmatterslive.com or at the YouTube channel of Spirit Matters Talk. Uh, what did I say? Spiritmatterstalk.com, not live. Um, and um, yeah, we interview spiritual teachers and um, scholars uh, of spirit who have spiritual uh, focus. Uh, a variety of people from a variety of paths. I like to say we've interviewed uh, famous people, you know, household word people, people whose books will show up on your lists, um, and people who should be well known. Uh, and um, we try to post them once a week. We have an archive of some 250, and most of them are audio. We only started doing them by video uh, this last year during COVID. But I encourage everybody, it's free, just go to the archive, it's our service. Um, and I, it's, it's like a, a whole spiritual bookshelf uh, in, you know, audio. Yeah. Well, Philip Goldberg, thank you for adding your 10 best spiritual books to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's library. I love you. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And before we close, you can find everything you need to know about Philip Goldberg's books, courses, workshops, American Vader tours, and his Spirit Matters podcast also at philipgoldberg.com. And if you don't want to miss any of these live streaming episodes, um, go over to the website and save your space, get your front row seat and be the first to know who's coming up next and also receive last minute reminders so you never have to miss any. And you'll find the sign up form on the video page at the no spiritualbookclub.com. That brings us to the end of this week's show, which will also be available on all the major podcast platforms. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer and I'll be back next week with another episode of the No. BS Spiritual Book Club's 10 Best Spiritual Books interview series. Till then, it's goodbye from me.